part five of breaking down Mike Bickle's personal statement. I am a trauma therapist specializing in narcissistic and spiritual abuse, and we are towards the bottom of the page. Mike writes, for an extended season, I will not engage in my public preaching ministry, conferences, social media, Zooms, etc. I see this as God's delayed loving discipline on my life, Hebrews 12, 6 and 12, 11. Hebrews 12, 6 reads, Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Hebrews 12, 11 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You know, I really love those scriptures, and I think they are very applicable in something like this. However, I also uh, don't know if I buy it. Um, I wish I did. I just don't know if I buy it simply because if I compare this document side by side with the emails that Mike had sent to Jane Doe's husband, the tone is very different. In this statement, it seems that Mike is open to whatever the Lord has for him, that he uh, believes that discipline is warranted and will be fruitful. However, back in October, when Mike is writing these emails back and forth with Jane Doe's husband, merely two months before writing this statement, he was trying everything he could pull out of his hat to get them to not go public. He did not want the discipline. He was not welcoming the discipline. He wanted what was in darkness to stay in darkness. He wanted what was in the past to stay in the past. And that was abundantly clear. Additionally, I'd like to see if I can add in an audio recording from 1988, I believe it was, uh, with Bob Jones and Mike Bickle discussing how God had repeatedly told them multiple times that if they were to fall to the sin of adultery even one time in any way, that would disqualify them from the ministry. Uh, They reiterated multiple times that God took this issue very seriously and that particularly for this kind of movement that they were being commissioned for, uh, they both knew that the sin of adultery, even just one time, would disqualify them from a leadership position in this ministry. How does Mike in one decade have such a grasp on the seriousness that the Lord took with this issue of adultery or sexual immorality um, and how necessary it would be for a person to be removed from a ministry after having committed adultery. And yet we're reading this statement and he is viewing it as he's repented. It's all under the blood. He received assurance from God that he was good to go. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, it appears that either he has selective memory or he is spinning the narrative in a way that it fits now, especially everything that has been made public, or he's flat out lying in one of these. He's saying here that he takes his sin very seriously and is open and receptive to any kind of discipline that the Lord has for him. And, you know, that that kind of echoes with the 1988 version of him that could see how serious a sin like adultery or sexual impropriety would be. Uh, and yet in this letter, it almost seems to me like he's playing dumb seemingly in efforts to minimize his understanding of the severity of the issues. Oh, I thought it was all under the blood. I repented in a way that resulted in receiving assurance from God. Uh, So which one is it, Mike? Was it serious that would disqualify you from ministry altogether or was it not? Let's keep going. I will look to other leaders to determine how long this season will last It may be long and may even be permanent. I will only re-engage in my public preaching ministry if God confirms it through others. I am at peace with whatever he wants. 2 Samuel 15, 25-26 Jesus, I love and trust you. 
2 Samuel 15, 25 to 26 reads, If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it in his dwelling place again. But if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. Sounds super good and super spiritual, right? Uh, I would just like to remind everybody that Mike has repeatedly talked about the favor and pleasure that the Lord takes in him. God's narrative over Mike's life, according to Mike, is one of favor and blessing. We can see that in the emails. I believe that he's even referring to this in the previous paragraph where he says, I have confidence that the Lord will speak concerning what he sees and says about me in his timing when he's asking people not to run to defend him. Additionally, Mike is surrounded by men who have consistently been confirming and affirming Mike's perceived narrative that God has over his life. We can do a deep dive into uh cult-like mentality, groupthink, things like that, confirmation bias, if you would like, in the coming weeks. Um, but I would like for everybody to have an awareness that uh, when Mike says that God is saying something and having it confirmed by people in his life, at least so far, these are mostly people that either A, Mike has uh only shown certain sides of his personhood to. They didn't know the full extent and full scope of what's going on. Um, and he has not submitted himself to accountability that would be allowed to disagree with him, to my knowledge. I don't know who in Mike's world he has uh, allowed to speak into his life and be a sharpening block because even some of his closest friends, colleagues, peers from over the years have come out and said, I didn't know what he was up to. And yet he has many loud defenders who believe in God's purposes, God's calling. And uh, funny enough, in a unity of the Holy Spirit, they, that pocket of people, are all hearing and feeling and perceiving that God is saying the same thing, which is green flags for Mike all around. I think it would take much more than Mike hearing it from God and having it confirmed through others for Mike to even consider the possibility of ministering in any capacity again. I literally couldn't believe what I was reading when he placed this paragraph in here at the bottom. I, I could not believe that he felt so emboldened to put an entire paragraph dedicated to the possibility of returning to ministry. I mean, maybe it'll be permanent, but like maybe it won't. I'll only do and say what God wants me to do here. I mean, he's been saying that for years and like, let's look at the fruit. Anyway, you get my point. Lastly, he says, I honor and love the IHOP KC community and will forever be grateful for them. They are a most remarkable people. They are truly marvelous comrades. I know the Lord is with them and that his favor and grace will continue to rest on them. Pray for me, Diane, and my beloved family. They have expressed their love and support for me in extravagant ways. Which, okay, pause. You know, I like all of this. I like that he's giving honor to the people in his life who he values and who value him. Uh, again, not a word or a sentiment for the potential victims in the situation or any of the people in the wake of his destruction. And another point to note about his family expressing their love and support for him in extravagant ways. I don't know what his point in putting that sentence is. Uh, part of me wonders like, okay, is that a sentiment of gratitude towards his family for showing their grace and their compassion? Or is this a leading and suggestive statement, uh, i.e. we praise the things we like to see? Uh, is there a veiled suggestion in that sentence that says my family has had an outpouring of love and support for me so other people can follow suit and have the same kind of love and support for me in extravagant ways? I don't know. Y'all can think I'm reading into things entirely too much, uh, but you know what? That's just my training and my clinical lens, so I'll just leave it there. With much sorrow, yet with prayerful confidence in God's perfect leadership, Mike Bickle.
here at the end, I will introduce one more term for you guys. We are going to talk about loaded language. So loaded language is essentially when someone uses words or phrases that carry a strong uh, emotional connotation. Uh, this is typically designed to elicit an emotional response from an audience. Um, it typically taps into their values or beliefs, sometimes even people's fears, um, and it's pretty persuasive. An unironic example would be uh, like distinguishing instead of using the word cult we're using new religious movement so when mike says prayerful confidence in god's perfect leadership what does that mean to you uh so he's confident he's confident that god is a perfect leader and when i read this in context of knowing what he has said about a resolve to live holy in all of his ways uh, fully submitting to God, uh, only seeing what God sees and saying what God says, things like he is 100% sure that God is saying this or he knows for a fact that God is saying that. When he says with much sorrow, yet with prayerful confidence in God's perfect leadership, that stands out as loaded language to me. The reason being, to me as the reader, it is insinuating that yes, God's a perfect leader, but Mike has confidence in his ability to follow God's perfect leadership. And he's been for decades claiming to be following God's perfect leadership and look where it's gotten us. So again, for Mike to end on a note of confidence in God's perfect leadership and the uh, entitlement that it's even a possibility to be back in ministry if God confirms it through other people, these are still just glaring red flags to me. He has not given any indication of a plan for what he intends to do with his time in spiritual timeout. He is still not even admitting or owning up to uh, a fault that he needs to continue to make amends for in any meaningful way. He talks a fair amount about what God can do, what God is going to do, how perfect of a leader God is, and how capable God is, but he has not indicated that he plans to take some actionable steps to partner with God or with other people for that matter in any form of inner work on himself, whether that be through therapy, counseling, some type of program, or making amends for any who might have been harmed from uh, whether it is content from these allegations or the ways that things have been handled so far. To me, this is just basically like, hey, I'm sorry, I thought I repented, but it wasn't that big of a deal and it was a really long time ago and I thought it was under the blood and now that it's public, I'm just making a statement and like I get that I need to be in timeout and you know, I'm not going to do anything in public ministry until God tells me to. I just want what he wants. I can't say with certainty because I don't listen to a lot of Mike's teachings, but the few that I have listened to, he has a lot of confidence in what he hears from God and Funny enough, it seems that God is always on the same page with Mike, and Mike is always on the same page with God. I would love to be wrong and to be corrected, but if anybody knows of a time in which Mike has publicly said, I was wrong about blank, that I thought I was hearing from God, and that led to a lot of confusion or turmoil, and I am sorry. Um, or does he kind of like dig his heels in and update the narrative, so to speak, so that he doesn't really have to address those kinds of things that he was not hearing correctly. This is my final opinion on this for now. I think that Mike needs to make peace with his own humanity as opposed to spiritually bypassing it. I think that he needs to speak more for Mike and less for God. I think that he needs to come into a greater understanding of the fear of the Lord after having known the love of the Lord and the mercy of the Lord. And I hope that he can see that this might not be Satan or the black horse or those who are energized by Satan exposing him, but it might be God's loving and tender care to him for the state of his own soul. I do want justice for the victims. And I also do hope that Mike uses this as an opportunity to 
reckon with what he's done because there are many who are wounded. Just as there has been good from Mike's ministry, there has also been much more trauma than I think anyone collectively has been made aware of until recent months. And Mike needs to take ownership for that. The ELT needs to take ownership for that. And instead of taking ownership for any of it, it seems that so far they are digging in their heels, hiding what can possibly be hidden, and stonewalling behind closed doors to let out the minimum amount of information because one of Mike's foundational messages he preached was on the loving thing to do was to not expose Christian brothers and sisters. He cherry-picked the verses, it seems, that fit his situation while neglecting all of the verses that talk about the importance of holiness, holding each other other accountable and exposing fruitless deeds of darkness. So Mike, if I can even call you a brother, now's the time to repent. If you haven't already, whatever you've been doing for repentance is not sufficient for the body of Christ. And I'm not to speak for God, but I'm not so sure that it's sufficient for your soul either. And there are a lot of people who are hurting in the wake of the destruction of their time at IHOP. You can't just put their healing on God. You need to take some sort of ownership and accountability and know that they're going to do the best they can to recover the pieces and fragments of their relationship with God, with themselves, and with others, and some of whom have walked away from the faith altogether because the brand of Christianity and the version of God they gave their lives to at IHOP Kansas City was not always safe nor healthy. This is not a scenario in which you can just press delete and move on. I think we all know who the father of lies is. And anyone who is still using their free will to partner with lying half-truths and narrative spinning has a lot to reckon with in the coming weeks, months, and years. To Mike and the ELT, I would say, yes, God is a perfect leader, but he does not need you hiding things on his behalf to protect the sheep. While I believe it is never too late to come clean and be honest, with each day that passes, the consequences for other people's lives who have been put in harm's way become more and more severe, prolonged, and drawn out. Perhaps it's not those who are speaking out on the internet who are causing division and taking their eyes off of Jesus. Perhaps the silence and the ambiguity is allowing Satan's divisiveness to grow. Mike, if you haven't already, I hope that one of these days you can see where you end and God begins. I hope that you can see that your thoughts are not always God's thoughts, that his thoughts remain higher than your thoughts and his ways higher than your ways. Perhaps you, just like the rest of us, need to come to terms with your own humanity and understand that even you have just as much capacity to be used as a tool of the enemy and have Satan breathe on your mind as the rest of us. And I hope that that is a sobering reality, that we all need God and we all need to value emotional and relational health. Accepting our vulnerability and what makes us human is the only way to fully appreciate the sacrifice that Jesus paid for. I pray for those who have been impacted directly. I pray for the Jane Doe's and I pray for the growing numbers of people who are starting to reconcile their experiences at IHOP and other charismatic communities. There are so many of us out here with spiritual trauma, and I don't think any one person has all of the answers, but I do think collectively validation, honesty, and integrity is a great place to start. Thanks to all who have taken the time to listen. Until next time, friends.